and to talk about uh, social movements in the Balkans. So, um, just for me to know if anybody is familiar with what is going on in the Balkans, um, do you know what, I mean, who of you knows about the protests in Serbia, if you can raise your hand? Or if any of you has heard about protests in Serbia going on? Okay. Um, protests in Albania? Okay. Montenegro? Okay. Um, we will talk today about this part of the world at the periphery of Europe, as I named it, and what is going on in terms of protests and uh, uh, people taking to the streets. This is a particularly interesting topic for me, and I think you will find it interesting as well. Although, as I can see from the majority of you, it's not something that we can see on the Italian media or in the newspaper. So don't worry if you don't know anything about it. Today you will find out something of what is going on there. Um, to give you an overview of what we'll be talking about today, we will start trying to understand what is a social movement and why people are protesting. So this is a small, really small and brief theoretical introduction to give you a bit of the context of what we are talking about. Then we will look at uh, the space of former Yugoslavia, or we can call it the Western Balkans, try to understand uh, why the protest emerged lately in the last decade. Uh, what were the constraints to mobilization and the obstacles preventing mobilization to occur in this part of the world? Uh, I will then present some of the movements I've been studying in the last decade, from the student movement to the right to the city movement, and the more uh, familiar, maybe for you, anti-establishment uh, protests that are still going on in this part of the world. And towards the end, we will try to understand together uh, what those protests have in common. So if there is somehow a connection among the different uh, protests uh, that are occurring, uh, as I said, right now, even if we don't know that much from the media. And then we will come to the conclusion, and of course, there will be time for uh, questions and answers. But let's start uh, to talk about uh, why do people protest? Why do people take to the streets? Um, do we have an idea, really, very freely, if uh, why would people take to the streets or why would you go and join a protest, for instance? If anybody wants to share their view or opinion or just thoughts. Nobody wants? Mm -hmm. Okay, so dissatisfaction. Okay. Any other idea? Sorry? Mm -hmm. So to advocate for your rights. Any other ideas? Okay, but this is already a good contribution. So people will take to the streets because they are dissatisfied. And uh, as I ask you this question, <laughs> uh, you have to consider that Many people before us uh, wondered why do people are taking to the streets? Why would they join a protest? Um, here I have a picture of the civil rights movements in the US. Um, th at the beginning, the first explanation that was provided was that people would join a protest in a spontaneous way, would take to the street in an irrational way, driven by emotion, and also that individuals would join protests in a sort of contagion, so the crowd would uh, be contagious and these emotions would bring other people to take to the streets. Um, so this was the first explanation, a psychological one actually, saying that people would, uh, individuals in general, would uh, be dissatisfied and take to the streets driven by these strong emotions and also in response to some structural changes. I'm, I'm, changes. I'm sorry, I hope maybe if I stand still there is no sound. Um, however, after this uh, first uh, psychological explanation, other scholars came, up, came out with another explanation of a political type. So they tried to explain protest and mobilization as a political phenomenon rather than a psychological one. And the explanation they provided were different. Uh, some said at the beginning of the 60s and the 70s, that uh, uh, social movements uh, would uh, be sort of enterprises calculating costs and benefits of uh, mobilization. 
and we try to gather resources of material type, human type, um, before uh, taking action. This uh, was one of the first theories that was elaborated in the US in the 60s and 70s. Other scholars uh, try to explain it as uh, looking at the political context in which those protests happened. Uh, and they elaborated the idea of opportunities. Basically, they said people would take to the streets because they have an opportunity to, to do so, or they perceive um, that the system, the political context is creating opportunities for them to take to the streets because they can have an impact, they can um, bring about change. Other scholars uh, explained it through this framing perspective that gives importance, attribute importance to ideas and meanings. So people would be driven by ideas uh, and the way this idea was presented and for this reason they would join uh, protest. In the 80s, uh, another approach was elaborated that is called the new social movement approach, although this was contested. Um, but this approach gave uh, more importance to identity. So um, the scholars elaborating this uh, new social movement approach claimed that actually individuals will not be driven by economic concerns, so they will not be advocating for um, the rise uh, of their salaries or for materialistic needs, but rather they would be driven by an idea of identity they were sharing. And this was an attempt to explain the emergence of, uh, for instance, LGBTQ movements. So cultural concerns were more important than economic uh, concerns. This brief introduction was just to explain to you uh, something that maybe we can take for granted. People would take to the streets just because they are dissatisfied, true. But uh, many other scholars in the last decades tried to explain in a more structural way and trying to find an explanation for this political phenomenon. Um, they also came about with the definition of what a social movement is. Um, and especially two scholars, uh, one from the University of Trent, also Mario Diani and Donatella Della Porta, found out uh, that there are at least uh, three characteristics that uh, can be attributed to a social movement. Uh, the first is a target, so a conflictual relation with a clearly identified opponent. This can be government, establishment, authorities, or uh, private companies. So there is a need of a target to talk of a social movement. Uh, there is a need of organizational infrastructure, so individuals and organizations on the streets has to be linked by what has been called dense informal networks. I'm not hiding it, okay, good. And uh, they have to share a collective identity beyond specific events. So not only a target, not only organization, but also the recognition and creation of connectedness. So we can talk about the social movement, uh, although other, of course, explanations were provided, but mostly when there are those three elements. The question, so this was what uh, the scholars elaborated uh, in the last decades. And what I've been wondering about in the last years is how does it work in the Western Balkans? Can we use the same uh, um, approaches, theories, and concepts that were elaborated in the US and in Western Europe to explain this part of the world that is different, uh, that has different characteristics from the Western Europe and North, uh, Northern America? Um, so this was, I'm still wondering of course about it, but now my ideas are a bit more, more clear and uh, I hope I will share some of those ideas with you. Uh, so can those uh, theories explain uh, the recent protests in the Western Balkans, uh, considering the different context? And now we will see how different the context of this part of the region is. Uh, to be on the safe side, um, the, when we talk about the Western Balkans, we talk about the former Yugoslav space, so the countries that once belonged to the socialist Yugoslavia, minus Slovenia plus Albania. So those are more or less the Western Balkans. Some people also consider Croatia not to be part of this definition of Western Balkans, um, but I included it as well. So we are talking about Croatia, Serbia, Kosovo, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Albania, and now it's called North Macedonia. But Macedonia. So we are talking about this part of the world. Uh, 
um, this part of the, of the world that so far, or at least in most of the literature, maybe you also had the opportunity to read some work on this uh, part of the world, um, approached the Western Balkans using um, what I call the ethno-national lenses. So looking at the Western Balkans as a place in which uh, to be analyzed through ethno-national perspective, through a focus on um, ethnic conflict, ethno-nationalism, given the fact that actually ethnic identification are still salient in the region. Uh, so scholars and people studying this part of the world try to focus on this aspect uh, of the Western Balkans, on the divisions created by the ethnic identification. Uh, in certain occasions, they try to say that they said that uh, ethnic mobilization is the most likely form of collective action expect, as expected. So, uh, mostly that uh, ethnicity will, uh, or ethnic identification would drive people into conflict, one group against the other. However, this was an approach that uh, functioned for a certain period, but that cannot explain what is going on nowadays when mass um, protests are occurring uh, all over the, the region. Uh, so what can we do with this dominance of ethnicity? Is it true or not that uh, ethnic, ethnic identification is salient? Uh, I brought this map of former Yugoslavia. Uh, in which you can see what has been called the ethnic makeup of Yugoslavia. So during former Yugoslavia, the idea of citizenship was uh, connected to uh, nationality or ethno-national identification, meaning that uh, uh, sometimes we approach former Yugoslavia uh, as a country divided along ethnic lines, a country, sorry, a context in which groups will be divided along ethnic lines after the war. Uh, of the, that happened after the, I mean, during the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, this is certainly uh, true that there is the, a certain type of ethnic identification on which the idea of citizenship in former Yugoslavia was based. Um, during socialist Yugoslavia, the idea of um, a Yugoslav citizenship was a sort of supranational identity and citizenship was um, um, somehow relying on uh, ethno-national identification. So they were the Serbs, the Croats, and so on. However, um, what I think it is important to mention is that uh, this is not the only identification, not the only collective identity in the country and in the uh, countries that emerged from the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, scholars like uh, Anderson, for instance, try to explain how ethnic identification and identity is not a property of an individual person, is not real or fixed. But identities are social processes and can be multiple. So it is true that in certain countries like Bosnia and Herzegovina, in North Macedonia, identity is shaping society, political process. Ethnic identity is also uh, institutionalizing the system since in both countries, for instance, there are ethnic quotas. However, what I try to do and what I think is also important to do is to look beyond this uh, ethnic identity to see if uh, people consider themselves as belonging also to another type of collectivity. So to consider, as I said, ethnicity, not as fixed and static, but a social process, uh, in which uh, if you look, for instance, at social movement scholars, I think they helped us to understand what in collective identity is, regardless of uh, which part of the world we are dealing with. For instance, uh, uh, Melucci, but also Pauletta and Jasper, who are scholars who dealt with collective identities, try to explain identity as a social process, a process by which social actors <laughs> recognize themselves and are recognized by other actors as part of a broader groupings and develop emotional attachment to them. So, uh, I think that in order to understand protests and mobilization in the Western Balkans, we should also start from the assumption that ethnic identification is uh, not real, but is uh, uh, a process, a social process uh, with uh, an emotional component. Um, also that collective identity and identity more generally is not exclusive, but inclusive and multiple. So an individual can be feel like close to several types of collectivities at the same time. Although 
in the Western Balkans, the ethnic identification is relevant. But there are many others, and now we will see how they became important over the last decade in the Western Balkans. So this was uh, a way to um, a bit challenge you to look at this part of the world with other lenses, so taking off these ethno-national ones and taking the one of social movements and mobilization. Uh, so starting from this assumption now, if everything is clear, we are ready to, we are ready to move to what are really uh, what is going on in the Western Balkans. Um, here is a picture from the mass protests that occurred in Bosnia Herzegovina in 2014. Does anybody know about those protests? Maybe if you can raise your hand. Okay, no, good. So we can talk about it. Also because it was a topic of my PhD dissertation, so I think I can tell you a lot about it. Um, so uh, let's look at what are the Western Balkans now and which part, what are the characteristics of this part of the world before looking more uh, in depth in the protest. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, we're talking about countries with the exception of Albania that were once part of Yugoslavia. Uh, but after the breakup of Yugoslavia, they witnessed conflict, wars, and uh, they came to the actual shape in 2008 with the independence of Kosovo. So if in 89 there was one uh, socialist federation of Yugoslavia, then uh, through several wars, I, I listed them, but okay, it's, uh, it's not important to know them all, but through a series of war, some countries declared independence, other witnessed a long conflict like Bosnia and Herzegovina, other uh, try, try to maintain the Federation of Yugoslavia, Serbia and Montenegro, and they separated in a peaceful way. Uh, Kosovo declared independence in 2008, as I said, and we came to the um, configuration we have now uh, with those uh, different republics. So we are talking about um, countries that have a recent history of democracy, but also that underwent a conflict, in some cases a violent one, if you think maybe, uh, as I said, of the conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina that lasted four years with a high number of casualties. Um, of course, to mobilize and to take to the streets in a post-conflict context uh, is not that uh, easy, or is not as easy as it can be in consolidated democracies like in Western Europe, because um, the fear of instability is present, and uh, also, um, in general, I would say citizens are afraid of mass gatherings and of what can happen. So, in general, people are uh, less uh, inclined to, to take to the streets because they are mostly afraid of violence. Um, if you think especially of countries that uh, underwent a conflict, you might come up with the idea that um, the divisions in the society are really um, strong. And again, I don't want to talk about ethnic groups, but there are uh, the social ties eroded even among um, people perceived as believing to the same social group, ethnic uh, group, let's so to say. Uh, because during the war, uh, especially, and I'm referring especially to Bosnia and Herzegovina that underwent uh, a war lasting for four years, um, the amount of uh, distrust among people, people living in the country, people fighting on the one side, people managing to escape through connection, uh, through personal connection is really high. So in general, we talk about a society that uh, um, was social ties have been eroded and social trust declined over the years. We're also talking about a context in which there is no tradition of mass protest. Um, I don't know who you, who of you is from Italy, but in Italy uh, we come from a long tradition of protest, um, student protest, if you think of your own university in Trento, but also uh, nowadays we have uh, feminist groups protesting, we had mass protests in the past uh, in the, for decades and decades. Uh, while in former Yugoslavia, actually protesting was not an issue, it was almost not possible. It was possible only towards the end of Yugoslavia, before the breakup. So there is no legacy of grassroots protest. It's, uh, somehow it's a new event, it's something new. Um, as I mentioned before, the identification with the um, ethno-national group 
is still strong and dominant and dominates also over other types of collective identities. Um, we will see also how it works in a while. And finally, another obstacle to mobilization, to collective action in uh, former Yugoslavia, plus Albania, so in the Western Balkans, um, is what has been called by a scholar Jakobson, the politics of anti-politics. So a certain disillusionment towards participation through conventional channels, uh, for instance, political parties, a low trust in institution, in democracy, so a certain refusal not only to take to the streets, but also to participate in politics. The idea that uh, um, the same politicians that were in power before the war are in power now, that there is no possibility of change through um, institutional channels, and in general, a certain degree of apathy also among uh, citizens. So all these uh, characteristics that does not, uh, do not help uh, um, social movement to develop, not even mobilization to occur. So as I said, protests are a very recent phenomenon that I would date to the last decade, more or less. Nevertheless, some protests happened. Um, especially, we see, I mentioned before, I was asking who of you is familiar with the protests in Serbia, Montenegro, and Albania, because those are really mass protests that, occurred, that are occurring now targeting in particular um, the establishment and the political elite. Um, what, does, what is in common among the different elites in the Western Balkans? Um, the, the state leaders of those countries are called stabilitocrats, and the um, expression used to define this type of regime, whose characteristic I will explain now, is stabilitocracy. Uh, this, um, this expression has been developed by scholars of the region um, and it has been used for analyzing the country by Bieber and Kmezic, especially in these, uh, those years. Uh, what is a stabilitocracy? It is a political regime in which uh, um, external stability is provided, apparently, and uh, it is a regime in which state leaders enjoy a certain degree of uh, legitimacy from European leaders, European Union leader. A legitimacy that, legitimacy that is consolidated through the promise of the European membership. Uh, you have to remember that the Western Balkans, with the exception of Slovenia and Croatia, are not yet part of the European Union. Those, political, those state leaders, however, while externally are, are behaving as a stable um, leaders, reformists, promising reforms, etc. On the domestic level, they are taking an authoritarian turn. So, for instance, we will see in a while, they are between democratic leaders, but also using authoritarian practices. Often they control uh, the media and repress uh, uh, this content. So there is a sort of this ambivalence behavior of uh, state leaders that are labeled as stabilitocrats. And a certain ambivalence also in the treatment of uh, the European Union leaders towards um, state leaders and governments in, this, in the Western Balkans. We, uh, you will see in a while how this is applied in practice. As I said before, state leaders, maybe some of you are familiar with uh, Vucic, the current president of Serbia. I think he's really the example of a stabilitocrat because he's a young, liberal, pro-Western reformist. So he's showing his pro-European face in public. It is considered as somehow a new man, although he was also, so to say, he, was, he covered important place even before the breakup of Yugoslavia. But he presents himself as being a post-transition ruler committed to European accession, um, promising democracy. Also, uh, during the refugee crisis, when Serbia was involved in the refugee crisis, since um, there were thousands of people crossing the, the, the territory of Serbia, he said he would collaborate with the European authorities. He was looking for the endorsement of European leaders. He presents himself as a pragmatic reformer, and uh, for instance, uh, he, secured the Euro he 
committed to secure the European border during the refugee crisis, promising reforms domestically. And I'm using the example of Vucic, but there are all the other leaders of the region <coughs> uh, are, um, have similar characteristics. However, at the domestic level, uh, the situation is a bit different. Uh, as those state rulers are relying on corrupt and clientelistic practices, often they don't grant media freedom. For instance, again, coming back to Alexander Vucic, the president of Serbia, is actually controlling all the press or almost <laughs> all the press in Serbia. And uh, they also, uh, these uh, um, stabilitocrats are also controlling the electorate and working in a permanent state of exception, um, somehow generating legitimacy through crisis. So consolidating their power as uh, being, uh, um, playing as a strong man in face of uh, uh, a state of crisis, for instance. Um, another characteristic is, characteristic is that in those countries, the parliaments are weak, um, the executive are unconstitutionally strong, and the judiciaries are often subservient. So um, again, I use the, the example of Alexander Vucic because it's also uh, very present in the media but uh, I think is really the, the good example of a stabil stabilitocrat. Uh, accused uh, domestically of being uh, corrupt, relying on these uh, clientelistic practices, contested in, in Serbia because it doesn't give, doesn't give, uh, doesn't allow media freedom and abusing of power, but um, it is praised by the European Union leaders since it is, a is granting uh, a certain degree of stability at the border of the European Union. So in this context, um, what is the role of the citizens? What are, what are how citizens are facing this uh, state of uh, uh, stabilitocracy, stabilitocracy? What are they doing? Uh, as I said, especially in the last decade, citizens in the Western Balkans have been active to an extent that is uh, new. In, uh, in the region. Mm, they've been active in different uh, contexts, in different ways. I will, uh, among the movements, I choose uh, three types uh, to talk about also because I think those are the most interesting for you. So I will talk briefly about the student movements, uh, the right to the city movements, or the movements against the privatization of urban space, and anti-establishment uh, movements or anti-government movements, as you, as you want to call them, that are the most recent one. So um, the students, ah, okay. Uh, what those um, movements have in common is that, coming back to the idea of the dominance of ethnicity but the presence of different identities, um, those movements overcome the centrality of ethnicity as a main category of identification and manage to activate an, uh, an identity that is alternative to the ethno-national one. So those are movements that do not advocate for the rights of a specific ethno-national groups. They do not take to the street in the name of an ethno-national group, but in the name of another collectivity that has oftentimes has nothing to do with, uh, um, with ethno-national groups. Sometimes uh, those uh, movements challenge the dominance of ethnicity Sometimes they just downplay it and uh, put it aside. So starting from student protest and faculty occupation, uh, maybe you are too young to remember, but in 2009, in Croatia and in Serbia, faculties were occupied um, in, in sign of protest with the reform of uh, the university system uh, that was to be adapted to the European uh, one. And uh, the, here there is a picture of the faculty of Zagreb that was occupied and later also the faculties in Serbia were occupied. So not only the students decided to occupy their, fa their um, faculties in sign of protest, but they also organized um, so-called plena uh, so the assemblies in which they discuss the future of university, um, they discuss the um, ongoing uh, uh, space, uh, private space that was given to, um, let's say the space given to 
private interests inside the university. And during this occupation, they also wrote this uh, uh, small uh, booklet called the Occupation Cookbook, in which they explain how they organized in Plena, uh, how they uh, decided together and using a um, decision-making uh, method based on direct democracy. And keep this in mind because it will be important to understand what went on later in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Blockada is, by the way, a movie, a movie documentary about the protest occupation in Croatia, uh, protest and occupation uh, by students in Croatia. So if you have the opportunity, watch it because I think it is really interesting to see how um, the students organized, how they debated, what was the issue at stake. And I really liked it, so this is a suggestion. Um, but the students were at the forefront of protest also in other countries. In North Macedonia in 2014, they were the ones starting a cycle of protests that continued later in 2016. They were the first to organize again against the reform of um, the university and public education. They were the ones to take to the streets in the country that back then was called the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, but now since March, February, it's called North Macedonia. So they were the first to organize, and later they trigger a protest that went on for years. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, a place that, if you are more or less familiar with it, but also because I mentioned it, is uh, still divided uh, along ethno-national lines, um, the pupils of the high schools protested for having their education uh, together. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, this is a brief parenthesis, um, not only the country is divided um, in, three, in three, I mean, there are three different uh, constituent peoples in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, um, those are the Croats, Serbs, and Bosniaks, meaning Bosnian Muslims. Uh, the country is divided along ethno-national lines, but also education is divided along ethno-national lines. That means that either pupils would go to the same school, but would attend different uh, classes according to the nationality they belong to, or that they, they go to different schools. So against this uh, segregation of education, some of uh, a group of students from Yaitse they decided to protest because they didn't want to take uh, uh, different classes. They want to stay united and to attend the same uh, class and study the same type of history. So they protested bringing together three different flags, that of Croatia, Serbia, and that of Bosnia and Herzegovina, to claim the right to, um, to go to school together, although there was this, uh, although in fact they, they, they couldn't do so. Um, finally, some of you said they are familiar with the context of Albania, so you might know of the student protests in Albania in 2018. Uh, this wave of protests started uh, last December, and it has been called the, the 68 of uh, Albania, since it is um, the first time that students uh, took to the streets uh, after uh, the communist regime. Um, they took to the street because in 2015, a law on higher education was approved, and uh, as a consequence, it gave more autonomy to the university, but also less funds from the state budget. So in a situation similar to that of Croatia, more space for private interest uh, um, was um, given. And in particular, it was stated that uh, uh, the students who couldn't pass the exam should have to pay to repeat it. So you can imagine uh, that how this can spark rage. <laughs> in the student population. So uh, the students of Albania took to the streets in December 2018, and they started a wave of protests that actually anticipated the protests that are going on now. They are different from, from what is going on now in Albania, but they were the first to take to the streets and to claim the right to a university more inclusive and, of course, um, less commercialized. Uh, this was the first wave of uh, uh, student protests, but there are also other movements uh, uh, that are um, not relying on ethnicity or ethno-national identification. Those are the right to the city movements, that are movements developed uh, against the privatization and commodification of public space, that are demanding uh, uh, more citizen participation in urbanization plans. What does it mean in practice? Um, it means that uh, places that are considered of public interest uh, 
are being transformed into commercial zones. This was the case of uh, Zagreb in 2010 uh, in Barshevska Street, uh, in which a committee of citizens decided to reclaim this space as a being of public property um, of common interest. And so they protested against the commercialization of this street that now, um, I mean, they failed somehow, but still they, they kept protesting for a long time. Um, in Banja Luka, something similar happened in 2012 when um, citizens took to the street against the destruction of the park that uh, functioned as a public uh, park, but was destroyed to make space to a commercial, um, to a shopping mall. Um, this is, I have to say, one of my favorite protests because here you can see there is a yellow duck. This is the symbol of the movement in Edavimo Belgrad. Uh, that is using uh, creative uh, repertoires of protest. So uh, what you can see on your left is uh, uh, the neighborhood of Savamala. It is a neighborhood in front of the river Sava in the capital Belgrade that was uh, a space uh, of where artists were living, they were countercultural spaces and so on. But according to unclear urbanization processes, this has been destroyed. Uh, to make space to these uh, luxurious apartments and uh, uh, to a project that is called the uh, well, uh, Belgrade uh, Waterfront, uh, Belgrade on the Water. Uh, that uh, is transforming what was an alternative part of Belgrade as something that only few people can enjoy because the price of those apartments are really high for Serbs to, for allowing local citizens to pay for them. And also it's transforming what was um, a place used by the collectivity on something <coughs> for private use of those who can afford it. So as a response to the destruction of uh, Savamala, a group of citizens decided of archi architects and, uh, but also activists, uh, artists, and later other people joined, decided to protest and to block, uh, uh, to block the construction buildings. They were not that successful, but uh, they were particularly funny because they took this uh, duck um, and they, um, they were going around the city with the duck. Uh, duck that in Serbia means uh, fraud. Uh, so denouncing that uh, the citizens were not consulted, uh, were not consulted uh, um, uh, when it came to the uh, reshaping the Savamala neighborhood. Uh, by the way, this duck was also arrested and sequestered by the police. So now they have a new one. Although this was a present from an artist, a local artist, who built it uh, with, uh, I don't know the word in English, but in Italian it's carta pesta. So this duck was the symbol of the movement. It appeared uh, all over the places in Belgrade. It also, they brought this duck also uh, to the uh, local council meeting and it protested in a very creative way until this duck, as I said, was arrested and they brought a new one that is easier to be transported. But still it is going around and wearing masks uh, and uh, I don't know if I have other pictures. No, I don't think so. But this was a way that really uh, granted them also support from the citizens because they found, them, uh, they found it funny. For instance, one night, uh, some of the buildings in this neighborhood were destroyed. Citizens called the police because it was not clear who was destroying the buildings, but nobody came. And it resulted in the end that um, uh, it, local authorities uh, had sent those persons to destroy the buildings overnight uh, in collaboration with the police. And nobody know who those uh, men, mask, mask men were, those who destroyed the buildings. Uh, so the day after, this duck appeared with a mask in front uh, of the um, government building uh, and said like, uh, it was me destroying the buildings. In a way, in a certain way, it was like making fun, but also uh, stressing the importance of citizens to have a say in the decision that affect their urban habitats. Uh, this struggle is still ongoing. Uh, with uh, funny repertoire, but still with strong demands for uh, citizens' participation. Um, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, also um, other protests were um, happening in 2015 when the National Library was reopened. But once it was National Library, but uh, it was set on fire in 92, when, they reopen when it was reopened, uh, it was not a, a <coughs> public library anymore. It is a place that can be rented for private uh, meetings. Um, as a sign of protest against the use for uh, private use of a public space, 
a group of uh, citizens sit in front of the National Library with a banner that reads uh, national li I mean, uh, public library, no reading space, and they started to read in front, uh, sitting on the, uh, on the stairs of the National Library to reclaim the right um, to use the space for uh, uh, the public. They also uh, try to protest for defending the uh, right of water in Sarajevo because um, water is a public s is run publicly, but uh, actually there are shortages of water very often in Sarajevo. Uh, so those were the protests, uh, so-called right to the city movements or um, protests against the privatization of what is considered a public good. And I think those were characterized also by these uh, creative repertoires. Let's come to the most recent ones, those that if you look carefully and if you read Italian in Osservatorio Balcani and Caucaso, you can find a lot of news about. So I invite you to read those uh, Osservatorio Balcani and Caucaso because those uh, anti-establishment anti protests are um, going on even now, and they're particularly uh, strong and massive. So while the student protests and the right to the city movement somehow were of a uh, small entity or gather people uh, um, acti already active, so to say, in, the, in this activist scene, the anti-establishment movements are involving a wider range of population. Uh, as I said that Albania, Montenegro, and uh, Serbia are now affected by those protests, but actually, the, the protest against the government occurred uh, already in 2013 in Bosnia and Herzegovina, where um, owing to a political impasse and problems among the um, political leader, uh, member of the parliament, it was impossible to issue any number for kids. So the kids could not have uh, the right to travel abroad or to have just ID numbers. And uh, uh, in to try to unblock this impasse, people took to the streets and occupied the Parliament Square. This, this was 2013. Maybe if we have time, we can talk more in detail about that. Uh, but another important protest that happened in Bosnia was in 2014. It was called Social Uprising. And it was characterized by, um, at the beginning, a lot of violence. Here you can see one of the buildings in fire. Um, to protest against uh, corruption, unemployment, but especially against uh, the privatization of factories that once were uh, socially owned, that were state-owned later, lately, and that now are, have been privatized. But the process has been unclear, and um, what, what happened in the end uh, eventually is that uh, those uh, factories bankrupted a lot of um, people found themselves unemployed and uh, while protesting in 2014 to claim their pensions and uh, uh, salaries back, they were attacked by the riot police. You can imagine that in a country that underwent a conflict, uh, attacking the workers had in a strong emotional meaning. So um, many groups uh, stood in solidarity with the workers and the protests escalated to the extent that uh, Citizens and protesters set fire to public buildings. Um, it was, uh, to a certain extent, uh, funny because they set fire to the um, headquarters of the political parties, uh, not of the opponents, but the political parties supposed to represent their own ethnic groups in a way to show that uh, it was a protest against establishment, not against the ethnic uh, so-called enemy. So the riot lasted for uh, three days until the situation calmed down and uh, all over Bosnia and Herzegovina some of the pro some uh, uh, plena, plenums were organized and here you can see that uh, I'm using the same word that I used for Croatia, plena. So assemblies in which citizens could participate, express their opinion, uh, talk, uh, following the guidelines that were elaborated by the students in Croatia, Serbia 2009. Uh, again, the um, a direct democratic model of decision making was used, so you can imagine how complicated it was. I assisted to some of those assemblies, and believe me, it was a mess, but it was really interesting to see as an experiment uh, uh, how it was to try to find agreement among all the people present there. 
Uh, the plena lasted for a couple of months, then of course also because of the method they were using, so giving voice to everybody, allowing everybody to speak, they ran out of steam. Uh, but still, I think those, this is one of the best experiments that we found in post-war Bosnia-Herzegovina. Also because the citizens in the plena finally had the opportunity to discuss about um, their concerns uh, and to elaborate demands that were later presented to their um, uh, politicians. With no result, unfortunately, but still. Um, later, in Bosnia, we have also protests for justice after the killing of uh, two young guys. Uh, one is David, that in March 2018 was found dead, um, but uh, under suspicious circumstances. It is supposed that it, the murder was covered by authorities. And this is a picture of the movement that is calling for justice for David. In a similar situation was Jenan, a guy from uh, another part of Bosnia that was still found dead. And uh, probably the local authorities are covering this issue. And it is still not clear, but probably in both cases, um, it was the police behind those murders. And uh, a sort of, if you're familiar with the Italian politics, a sort of caso Cucchi. This is uh, still not clear, but the, what is interesting is that both, uh, in both cases, the father of those kids, one um, killed in the Serbian part of Bosnia and the other belonging to a so-called Muslim family protested together to call for justice, regardless of uh, ethnic identities. Let's now move to the protests that occurred in North Macedonia. Uh, maybe I will not enter into details because we are a bit late. Mm, but in this case, in 2015, 2016, after a series of scandals uh, uh, about corruption um, and illegal influence on the judiciary, the citizens of Macedonia took to the street to protest against the, um, the back then uh, prime minister, the uh, that is, uh, was called Gruevski. So this uh, protest against him and accusation of being corrupted was uh, counterbalanced by a protest in favor of this government. So 2015, there were two uh, kind of movements in Macedonia, one, anti the pre one against the premier and the one in favor of him. Um, then, after this series of protests, other occurred. Uh, this is called the Colorful Revolution, in which uh, uh, the front and the establishment was united and uh, um, the um, attempt to protest was done this time by throwing uh, uh, paint, uh, colored paint, uh, to the main building. Um, in Albania, we saw the protests that I mentioned that are still ongoing. In this case, uh, they are different from the student movements because in this time they are led by the opposition parties in Albania, the opposition party that are standing on the right while uh, the PM, Edi Rama, is, uh, let's say, socialist. Um, and uh, it, those protests were a violent type since uh, the um, opposition party attacked the offices of PM Rama and also they called, uh, uh, they called for his resignation elections and they stormed into the parliament. Uh, to move to Serbia, that is a uh, very important important protest now. Maybe you have heard of this uh, Jedan of Pet Miljona. A movement one in five millions because uh, this is an anti-establishment movement. Uh, people are taking to the streets since December 2018, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not mistaken. The case was at the beginning the attack of a leader of the opposition that once again, the responsible of this attack were not uh, uh, were not known, but it was supposed that it was uh, uh, somebody um, part of the political party in power that is expressing also the presidency of Vucic. Um, the protest became broader and broader, and I will skip the details, but uh, um, more and more people gathered against the uh, to protest against the authoritarian rule of Vucic who uh, was very provocative, he said that we not change his course, not even if there were five million protesters on the streets. That's why uh, this uh, slogan was appropriated from the citizens who called themselves like one, we are one of these five million protesters. Every Saturday, protests are ongoing in Belgrade. If you check the news, you will see. 
And last year, uh, sorry, last month, uh, here you have the picture, the protesters driven this time by a far-right group uh, known as Tveri, uh, enter the radio television of Serbia State Broadcaster because they claimed that the state television was not giving them enough space. Mm, they said that, uh, and this is partially true, if you watch the Serbian TV, while on the, for instance, I was in Bosnia back then, while in Bosnia I could see um, the protests going on and the, uh, when the protesters entered the, the state television of Serbia, this could not be seen in the Serbian TV. Um, actually, nowadays the protests are, st are still going on every Saturday, although there is a sort of concern for the far right taking over uh, this uh, protesters front that is uh, heterogeneous, involving different groups and different uh, sort of citizens. And finally, we have Montenegro, 2019, so still ongoing. A protest uh, that, like in Macedonia, was triggered by um, an accusation of corruption of the Djukanovic, the president in place since 30 years. This um, uh, corruption uh, scandal was, uh, was uh, emerged out of this envelope affair. Uh, in which it was found that um, a member, one of the leading members of the political party of Djukanovic received, was bribed, actually. So uh, this triggered again mass protests and uh, people in Montenegro took to the streets claiming they were against corruption and organized crime <laughs> and the connection among president and the parties pressing the president and uh, um, the criminal networks in Montenegro. Uh, the movement is Colo Duprise, so resist. And uh, uh, here you can see one of the um, banners taken on the streets. And again, the civil society is involved uh, and also the opposition party that in some cases are pro-Serbian right, but also civic-oriented left. So at the moment, the protesters' front is really heterogeneous. We are from an intellectual to the right to the left, all calling for the resignation of Djukanovic. And this coalition uh, signed a document called Agreement for the Future. It was signed in 30 March, in which uh, uh, political, I mean, it obliges um, opposition party to work together to organize the first free and fair elections in the history of Montenegro. So again, uh, most of those movements, and the case of Montenegro is the really uh, most recent one, are calling for the resignation of their political establishment. Uh, having said that, and I hope you're not lost among these different types of protests, uh, let's look briefly because of time constraints. What do they have in common? Uh, I think that if you follow me so far, more or less you understood that there are similarities. But uh, let's look at them more in depth. So first of all, they have in common a background. We said uh, we are talking about stabilitocracies. Uh, strong men in power calling themselves as being uh, reformers and um, liberal democrats. However, this is not the case in practice because this transition to liberal democracy is considered by the majority of citizens uh, uh, failed. Endemic corruption is still uh, an issue and uh, unemployment uh, continues to be very high and this is still a norm. Uh, the transition to market economy, as the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also other countries, uh, uh, but I think Bosnia and Herzegovina, with the protest of workers, showed it very clearly failed. Um, the privatization process of the properties that once belonged to the state, since former Yugoslavia was a socialist country, the privatization process of those properties underwent in an irregular way, unclear, and of, often involving uh, warlords and uh, ethno-national entrepreneurs, so to say. Often after the privatization, the, those factories were closed and the workers were dismissed. And let's have a look also at the European Union. Uh, the president of the European Commission, Juncker, a few years ago talked about uh, European enlargement fatigue. So mostly he said, that uh, he couldn't promise uh, the um, accession into the European Union to the Western Balkans, uh, because this, this is a difficult moment, you know, for the European Union, for the different crises the European Union is facing, from Brexit to the refugee crisis, and so on. So uh, the citizens in the Western Balkans feel that uh, there is no prospect for European accession, or there is, but in an unclear future, and also that the European Union is not uh, delivering the promises, not fulfilling the promises uh, it made 
So there is no actually transformative capacity of the European Union since citizens cannot control their politicians and they cannot really appeal to the European Union to control the same politicians the European Union is endorsing. I remember in Bosnia-Herzegovina, for instance, during the protests, people were raising a banner saying, European Union, we are the ones you have to listen to. So the citizens of Bosnia-Herzegovina were calling for the European Union to listen to them rather than to their politicians. But this was not the case, unfortunately. So in general, in all those countries, there is a sort of lack of trust in the European Union and a disillusionment on the prospect of future European enlargement that is taking longer than expected and is not enough rewarded. The frustration is also growing. Also, if you are familiar maybe with the refugee crisis and what went on, you might know that there are thousands of migrants now that are stranded in Serbia, stranded in Bosnia. Uh, there is no clear migration policy in those countries and the European Union actually is giving funds to those countries but mostly to secure the borders rather than to deal with the migrants. So the frustration among the local population, especially those that are affected by the presence of migrants is going on. Um, but who, are, who is protesting in those countries? Um, I call them united in diversity because I mentioned briefly, but uh, if you start reading, you will see that on the streets you can find uh, civil society actors liberal actors, but also the far right, as I said, now in Serbia, is, the importance of the far right is growing. There are also radical left forces that started the protest, for instance, in Montenegro. The presence of political parties is different. In Bosnia and Herzegovina, the citizens in the plenums refused completely the presence of political parties and NGOs. They didn't want to collaborate with them and they put a banner on them. In Albania, now the protests are driven by the right-wing political opposition, while the students in Albania refuse the, to ally with political parties that offered um, their support. In Serbia, as I said, far-right groups are somehow hijacking the protests. In Montenegro and in Macedonia, there is an alliance between opposition parties and civic coalition. Um, I didn't explain, but in Macedonia, after this wave of protest, two years of wave of protest, the, um, this coalition between civic actors and opposition party managed to uh, reach the change in the government, and now the new government is somehow an expression of uh, the protesters' front. So there is a diversity of people taking to the streets. We cannot call them progressive protests, not uh, uh, right-wing protests, but it's a... Um, there are different uh, participation of political parties and different part of the movement. Um, that is also makes it difficult to label those protests. Triggers, so what, the, what was triggering those protests? Um, often scandals, revelation of, uh, in Macedonia was called a bomb, uh, the case of uh, corruption of political parties. Uh, of the political parties in power. Often uh, those um, sudden revelations are provoking emotions, uh, strong emotions, because we are talking about scandals related to corruption and bribes of uh, high-level officials, or uh, um, involving the most vulnerable part of the population. This is the case of Bosnia, for instance, the killing of two young people, um, the impossibility of uh, babies to travel and move abroad from Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, the envelope affair in Montenegro is an example of a uh, scandal related to corruption, the same in Macedonia. And uh, uh, the physical attack of political opponents in Serbia also triggers strong emotions. So those protests start from uh, uh, scandals mostly that are all of a sudden revealed to the population. Uh, the youth are playing indeed a great role because they are often the students that drive or at least anticipate the protest. They are also those more uh, Europeans, so to say, because they belong to a generation that never lived under Yugoslavia, so they don't retain a memory of Yugoslavia. They mostly refuse to ally to political with political parties and are also those who grew up with this dream of transition. And here I quote one of the interview, uh, interviewee that told me, we woke up from the dream of transition. So this generation is a post-Yugoslav one growing up after the war with no memory of socialist Yugoslavia, no memory of the right of workers. 
no memory of the communist regime in Albania, but always uh, growing up with the, the idea of uh, a better future after the transition. But actually, lately, eventually, it was found out that this transition didn't have happen or uh, didn't uh, deliver the success they were expecting. There is an interesting uh, part also that they are also uh, immune to, or seems to be immune to nationalist rhetoric. So with them, the rhetoric of the ethnic enemy or the war against uh, the ethnic other does not appeal. So they rather would mobilize against establishment uh, rather than against the ethnic other. So again, this stress the need of looking at this, uh, um, this part of the world, the Western Balkans, without uh, taking ethno using ethno-national lenses. Uh, finally, uh, the demands on the streets are very broad. So although the issue that um, was at the be that started the protest, sparked the protest, was a particular one, then it was uh, somehow it triggered a broader political, social, and economic discontent. A discontent that is targeting the political establishment that is considered being captured by narrow interests by political parties. The demands are often the end of endemic corruption, um, a solution to the high unemployment rate, and again, demand of economic types, so the inadequate economic transition. Uh, more concrete demands are top officials to resign, free and fair election to be called, and media freedom. Those are more or less the demands that are on the street, were on the street since 2013 from Bosnia and Herzegovina until now in Serbia, Montenegro, and Albania. Uh, I mentioned before the discourse strategy, and I think this is one of the most interesting parts. So the demonstrators use, rather than a nationalist discourse, they use a populist discourse. So the clean people, the virtuous people against the evil elite, a discourse that has a moral component uh, uh, that divides we, the citizens, regardless of ethnic divisions, the pure people against the corrupted elite. So it is we against they, not anymore we ethnic group of Bosniaks against uh, Serbs, but uh, we, the, sit the collectivity of citizens, and here we come back to the idea of identity, to them, they, the corrupted elite. Um, it seems that the leaders in power, the state leaders, are not really able to respond to it because they keep repeating the same discourse. So um, they use, the leaders use the same nationalist discourse, saying that the demonstrators are traitors of the nation. This was the case in Bosnia. Uh, the politi local politicians would claim that the protests were against the Serbs or they were uh, Bosniak against the Serbs, or for instance, <laughs> uh, Serbs against the Bosniaks, but this was not the case. Um, the um, leaders also described the protest as being political and non-civic in nature, so somehow uh, trying to deprive the citizens of their agency, claiming that they are political, meaning driven by a political party, even when this is not the case. And again, uh, local politicians are playing on the idea of stability. And here you can find a connection, connection with the stabilitocracies. Um, the idea of stability, as I said, in a post-conflict country, in uh, non-consolidated democracies, a very recent one is a serious issue, especially in countries that witness the conflict. So calling that the threats are, a, that the protests are a threat to the stability of the country is depriving the protesters of their legitimacy. Um, and somehow downplaying their role. Uh, however, I would say that the leaders are using this rhetoric that is not really, um, seems not to work anymore that much. Uh, repertoires of action, this is uh, meaning the, the tools that protesters are using on the streets. Uh, I use the example of the dark in Belgrade, not only because I like it that much, but also because it shows that uh, the protest, protests are more and more uh, using creative uh, tools of contention on the one hand. On the other, they became really uh, violent. Uh, in the case in Macedonia, the protesters broke into the parliament. In Serbia, they broke into the uh, state television Serbia. In Albania, also, they attacked the parliament. In Bosnia, they set fire. This is a picture from Bosnia. Um, they set fire to the buildings uh, representing authorities. So the uh, protests are becoming more and more violent. Uh, on the one hand, this is um, 
increasing the, the power of demonstrators. On the other, it also shows that street protests and violence are becoming normalized in this part of the country as somehow it is in Western Europe. In certain cases, the streets is able to enter into the institution, so to say. So from the streets, sometimes the opposition comes out, um, the, or they manage to express political leaders that later enter into the parliament, with the exception of Bosnia and Herzegovina, where, as I mentioned before, no alliance was um, looked with political parties, and not only alliance, but no political parties was created after the protest. And in general, this fear of instability uh, was overcome over the years and also through uh, mass protest. Here I come to the conclusion because we're running out of time. So uh, what is interesting to see is that uh, streets and public space are claimed as sites of political action. Not only public space uh, as, a, as a show like uh, certain neighborhoods or certain parks or a public library, but also the public space of squares and um, yes, public space and the street. This is becoming more and more normal to be used by citizens to express their discontent. Also because um, on the, the electorate is considered not to, be, uh, not to have all the power that is expected to be in the uh, ballot box. Uh, the tools of contention, as I said before, they are uh, traditional, so mass protest, but also creative and at times disruptive. Social media play an important role and also digital devices because especially to uh, find a way out of this uh, media control by um, the, the party in power, um, citizens and demonstrators are finding a way to, um, for instance, reach out uh, to also to show what is going on in their country through, through social networks. In some cases, it's also organized through social networks, but for sure, uh, as, I'm, as I said before while watching the TV in Bosnia, uh, it is easier to find about those protests on the social media than on the official channels. The political alternatives, however, remain weak. There are no political parties in many cases able to counter power, counteract the power of the politicians and the political parties that are um, in power now. But to conclude, uh, uh, coming back to the beginning, uh, the most important element is that uh, ethnic identification is downplayed and other, what we call in social movements, social cleavages, so other identification, other divisions became more salient uh, especially, as I said, uh, the division between citizens and establishment rather than one ethnic group against the other. So from a nationalist type of discourse, we came to a populist type of discourse, and this somehow shows some uh, commonalities between the protests that are going on in the Western Balkans and those that are going on in the rest of Europe. And having said that, I have to conclude. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks again, for <laughs> Professor Belloni, for inviting me. Um, any sort of question is welcome. And I can also give you my email in case you want to know more about, or if you want to look for information. I can suggest some. Thank you very much, Chiara. We have, a, we have a few minutes, so I'd like to take advantage of this time left to um, a few questions or, have, or comments or anything that you want to share. I have a question. Uh, will you then Google Serbia, Albania, Montenegro protest from tonight? It is not very these protests are not very um, visible on, mm -hmm. uh, on the media. mainstream yeah. media. Mm -hmm. they, they reach us through Observatorio Bal Balkanic Outlook, mm -hmm. for example, and other outlets. But generally speaking, they, we are so concerned about our own little area. Oh. And now, of course, there are European elections and so on and so forth. But um, there is a lot going on from the bottom up in the mm -hmm. Balkans as elsewhere. Yes. And, um, and I think we ignore it our, at our own peril, so to, mm -hmm. so to say, because um, um, much, is, much is changing from the bottom up, and which is also a message of, um, of engagement, in mm -hmm. a sense, because um, 
there are political students and so on and other move and civic movements uh, um, taking the street and protesting and uh, advancing demands and so on. I'm going to stop a second to see if there is any. Yes, one and two. You have, please use the microphone, otherwise. Uh, since uh, we are discussing, like, for example, a session to the EU, uh, it's not really uh, in the foreseeable future, it's not happening. But these protests will have uh, implications for uh, the eventual mm -hmm. session, or are they considered like something that will stop eventually? So discussion and negotiation will uh, take place as always. Can I answer or should I? Okay. Um, well, uh, the Premier Edi Rama in Albania expresses concern for the protests going on because uh, the accession talks are supposed to start in June. So it was somehow uh, afraid or worried about uh, uh, showing this instability in the country because the opposition parties, um, when they stormed the parliament, when they protested against him, are for sure showing that the country is not as stable as it is supposed to be. I don't think they will have a direct implication, the protests in Albania or the others, but for sure they send a message to the European leaders that there is a need of uh, listening more to the citizens and what the citizens are saying about their own domestic elites. So I don't think they will have an impact, a negative impact. Actually, they can have a positive one since they can somehow uh, show what are the limits also of the domestic uh, situation. But I don't think, especially now with the European election coming and the European accession process uh, that is frozen for the time being, that will have any impact. We will see with the, after the elections what will happen. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, which one of the theories you showed us before could be the most useful to describe these protests? Sorry, which one? Uh, which one of the theories uh, you showed us mm. before could be the most useful to describe uh, these protests? This is an interesting question. Uh, thanks. I think there are many ways of uh, explaining those protests. Because if you look, for instance, at the opportunities, um, again, the case of Albania is really um, interesting because the students were the first one to protest and somehow they show that the, um, there is an inst there can be an instable situation in Albania or there is some uh, space for uh, create even more instability and I think that other protests follow afterwards because political parties, opponent, opponent political parties saw an opportunity for it. However, you can combine different theories. Of course, also the resource mobilization theory uh, is useful because People would protest when they have resources to do so, when they manage to gather resources that come from um, having political allies siding with them, having external actors supporting them. So I think that several approach of social movement theory can be used to explain those protests. And then of course there are different, uh, um, I mean it is different from case to case. But there is, yeah, no, no, not one explanation, I think different approaches can be combined. And different approaches be applied to different pro protests, like for example, yeah. in Bosnia, they refused alliances, so it's more like new social movement, I think. Yes. But, uh, um, for example, student protests are more resource mobiliza mobilization, maybe. Yes, there are different approaches. Uh, my PhD study was about the protest in Bosnia, and I tried to explain exactly that, that although there were opportunities, and they managed to gather resources, the actors in the street, they, did not, they refused actually to ally with uh, other political parties, so they somehow um, didn't allow, I mean, this didn't allow the protests to develop or to take a certain direction. Then the importance of identity is um, an issue, of course, and how this identity was framed. For instance, the idea of uh, being citizens of a country is becoming becoming more and more salient, so of not defining themselves as belonging to a certain international group, but rather to their citizenship. And this in the case of Bosnia and Herzegovina or Macedonia, that is also, uh, that counts on an uh, Albanian minority, is something that is uh, new, a new frame, a new discourse, so to say, that is putting together people belonging to different groups. 
Any other slide? Second. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. And um, my question would be if there's, uh, if there's the existence of one uh, crucial actor in all these uh, protests, because when you um, when you compare to, to typical uh, Western European countries, you uh, often find uh, trade unions or labor unions uh, as a crucial uh, actor for uh, organizing protests. And um, yeah, my question would be uh, which which uh, part they play, which role they play in the in the Western Balkans in organizing these these conflicts, because most of the conflicts were more about like I. Um, identity topics, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Um, I studied in depth the role of trade unions in Bosnia and Herzegovina because they played a role in 2014, for instance. But again, it depends from case to case because in Bosnia, the trade unions were not present in 2013 while they were the ones sparking actually the protest in 2014. So uh, depending on the topic, I would say they play different roles. The same with political parties that in Macedonia were absent at the beginning, they jumped on the protester front later. In Albania they are organizing, so it depends. I would say that in general, uh, we have the, um, in some cases the trade union are present, although often in the Western Balkans the trade union are also somehow acting um, according to certain political parties. In other case, we have uh, the usual urban activist. Uh, this is the case of right to the city movement. Civil society is playing a great role. What I would say is common in all those uh, protests is that a certain refusal to uh, involve formal actors. So even when they are part, when there are associations or parties involved in the protest, there is an attempt to um, call the protesters front as heterogeneous without giving too much importance to one of or another actor. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Chiara, for Thank you. being with us today. And uh, luck with your research. We look forward to reading your, your book. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> See you on May 2nd. Have a nice Easter break. And Google. <laughs> no, I read, if you read Italian, but there are some art articles in English, Osservatorio Balcanic Caucaso, East Journal, and I think it is interesting to keep following those protests and how they develop. So thanks for your attention, and have a nice Easter break. <laughs>